Hi, everybody. I am Federico Dolce, and I'm the spokesperson for Dion25 Italy. I am hosting today because today is a special occasion. Uh, joining me and our very own Yanis Varoufakis, we have a very special guest. She is an international lawyer and academic, and the UN appointed a special rapporteur for the occupied territories of Palestine. She is the author of the book Jacuz. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Francesca Albanese. I have to start with this question because you wrote this book and you told that it wasn't a, a instant book wrote after October the 7th. It was something about the situation in Gaza before. And I think that that is the key of many aspects on how we see and how we judge what's happening now in Gaza. So can you please tell us how was it? Jacuzzi was written, um, was published in November 2023 and was com completely reconsidered, resolved uh, um, after the 7th of October for a reason I will explain. But it was already in the making as of uh, May, June uh, 2023, and I started working with uh, Christian Elia, the journalist who eventually interviewed, uh, interviewed me, uh, because what we wanted to write was a, a broader, um, a, 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 let's say, a broader account of Palestine explained, particularly with the Italian public in mind, because Italians are prevented from, as many people in the West, as many people in the, um, particularly in Europe, are prevented from understanding, understanding, knowing, and knowledge is essential to have an informed discussion. And you cannot condemn before having that, that discussion. In that, I mean, you cannot take side without proper information, which is in fact what happens because of ignorance and because of lack of understanding. So this is what we wanted to tell through my personal story. And then what happened on the, on the 7th of October is that there was such a shock, uh, of course, because of the violence um, deployed on against Israeli civilians in Israel on the 7th of October, but also because of all of, the, all of a sudden disappearance, disappearance, the sudden disappearance of everything that had preceded the 7th of October, which is, is that is critical to understand the reality of, uh, of Palestine for the Palestinians, what this, how the Israelis relate, interrelate themselves with the Palestinians. And then this is when we decided that what was needed, in fact, was to build on the 7th of October and the in, immense shock that it had been for, for many to understand key uh, concepts, like which anyway I would have uh, covered in the, in the first idea of the book, which are colonialism, apartheid, um, terrorism, um, self-determination, and uh, yeah, uh, I mean, what, what we unpack throughout, uh, throughout the book. So yes, it's, it, it was instantly produced, but it was uh, conceived for a long time. The most pernicious aspect of um, the last eight months during this genocide is uh, the complete ignorance <laughs> of Europeans, primarily, but not just Europeans, of course, Americans as well, on what was going on before the 7th of October. Um, and it's wonderful that your book is uh, shedding light on this, uh, Francesca, because, um, you know, most people had no idea that, you know, more than half of the children in Gaza were malnutrition before the 7th of October. They had no idea. Of, yeah. Uh, they had no idea of the conditions of apartheid on the ground in the West Bank. You know, I used to describe, I remember, to Germans, to Italians, to Brits, to Americans, you know, the, how, how long Palestinians had to wait in soul-destroying queues uh, around, you know, the uh, Israeli army in order to cross over from their home to their olive grove, um, from school to, uh, to their home from their school to their hospital if they got injured. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pe just people were not aware of that. They thought that it was perfectly okay. Everything was okay, not perfect, but that there was peace. And yeah. then on the 7th of October, some Palestinians went completely mad and stormed the Israelis. So <laughs> well done for writing this book. I agree with you. Although I don't think that ignorance is, the, is casual, it's um, or it's innocent. 
I think that the, the, the ignorance, like lack of knowledge of facts, but also lack of understanding has two main roots. On the one hand, it's, um, and probably they have something in common. On the one hand, there has been a, a, a metaphor uh, from Israel and the many groups which support Israel uh, as a Zionist project, as a state for the Jews, uh, first and foremost, if not for the Jews only. Well, there has been an effort to undermine whatever is Palestinianness. Like an erasure of the people in the in the public imagination. So the revision of history, uh, the, the 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 transformation of how they they are perceived. So that there are there is always something dark and negative associated with them. Are there's that these are terrorists? They are savages. They are underdeveloped. They are uncivilized. After all, they they are Arabs, right? And this is the second element. It builds into the racism, the century-old racism that as Europeans, as Westerners, because it all gen- the West generate from Europe, we have forgotten, but we are the product of 500 years of colonialism, both us as Western, so- I mean, European societies and the United States and Canada and Australia. And New Zealand, these are settler colonial states. And this is what Israel aims to become. They do not have in mind as the end goal uh, South Africa, apartheid South Africa. They have in mind the United States. So the land without the people or with the people totally subject. And this is the reason why we as society instinctively or a political system instinctively support it is because we remain fundamentally racist. That's absolutely right. The only silver lining to the massacre, to the genocide of uh, Palestinians, is that the West has had a crash course in uh, the reality on the ground. Uh, The manner in which uh, American students have uh, rebelled in the campuses, that uh, these discussions are now being had, uh, is um, it's a source of hope. Uh, against this institutionalized historical racism that you are portraying mm. so vividly. Uh, but Francisco, let me also remind you that, you know, our racism is very selective. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the West is very good at segregating Arabs between deserving and undeserving. So, you know, if you have a lot of oil and a lot of money, um, then this racism is suspended, as in the case of Saudi Arabia, for instance, or the United Arab Emirates. And one of the greatest uh, contributors to the erasure of Palestinian voices and the Palestinian cause before the 7th of October was the Arab states. Uh, Remember, the United Arab Emirates, Morocco, uh, of course, Jordan and uh, Egypt before that had uh, uh, not only peace treaties with uh, Israel, but actively cultivating commercial and defense links. My own country hearing you know, Greece is also guilty of that over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and in a sense, this uh, uh, rebellion, uh, which uh, involved, as rebellions often do, a lot of cruelty and crimes against Israeli civilians, but at the same time, it was a rebellion against the war and against occupation. That rebellion uh, with all the blood and tears and uh, atrocities even involved in that uh, made it impossible for Europeans and Americans to continue um, you know, turning a blind eye. And I think that is, that is really very important. And this is the time to bring out books like yours. This is the time to go back to what was happening before the 7th of October, but also, let me say, to go back to what was going on before the Nakba in 1948. Uh, because, yes. you know, the terra nullius uh, doctrine, that that was a, an empty land, uh, an uncivilized land, a land of nomads, of uh, Arabs, of Muslims, of Bedouins, and so on. And you know, in, in the same way that the Native Americans were first um, killed spiritually and um, discursively by being declared non-humans or humanoids before yeah. being... <laughs> killed and uh, impounded and and interned 
Uh, the same thing happens with regard to Palestine. So I'm very pleased that Palestinian filmmakers and others are retrieving wonderful films and books and uh, a whole cartography of life before 1948, uh, which, you know, if anybody who looks at it realizes that it was a highly civilized place, a place with railways, Absolutely. a place with, uh, with, with motorways, with, uh, you know, with libraries, with operas, and therefore a place that was exactly the opposite of Terran Mulius. So going before the 7th of October, like you were saying, but also going before 1948 is an essential aspect of, um, of, of doing away with Terran Mulius and castigating mm. Zionist uh, monstrosity, declaring, declaring it a land without the people. Jan, I would like to, to take you back to something you said at the beginning, because I don't think that this is the... This uh, is a contradiction to my earlier assumption, meaning that there are certain Arabs, you know, certain Arabs like the Emirates or the Saudis and others uh, who, are, who do not meet uh, um, European racism. The settler colonial mentality is that, is such, the, the colonizer, the settler group has always relied on a particular group within the, the larger the larger uh, community, which wanted to, which one, which was wanted for colonization, for annihilation, for uh, displacement in order to take their land and resources, it has never been different. They always need a local entity to rely upon. They they need accomplices. This is and this is what they are getting, and I agree with you. Um, and I have a question for you on this. I I agree with you that there is a hope in the current uh, generation, as demonstrated by the protests. And what gives me hope is, first of all, their capacity to indignate them, indignate themselves. I mean, this indignation that they bring forward as a form of protest is a sign of health that many of our generations are not showing. They sit on their hands and on their privilege, thinking that they can do, they can do nothing to help the Palestinians, or, but also to help the Israelis, because it's not that they're, they are better indoctrinated as, as they are, uh, raised as they are to hate the other. But the, the, there is one other element that gives me hope, the fact that this, this young generation is, on the one hand, very practical, very concrete. It's not that they carry, they, they are mobilizing uh, under a banner, stop the war, stop the genocide, that's it. No, they have broken down, they have articulated their requests in very concrete terms, and they have done it across the globe because they've been in encampments physically or remotely. And all of them have, have developed their own critique of what their own institutions, the university, does and has, which contributes to maintain the, the or to feed into the unlawful enterprise that Israel represents, primarily through institutions, through the military industry, the scientific industry, and or the, the exploitation of natural resources. There is so much that they have cracked themselves. They have studied, understood, so they are much more mature than, for example, my generation was in, in opposing the system. The other thing is that unlike our generation, I mean, um, they, they see the interconnectedness interconnect of a number of injustices. So they see themselves much more connected to the, to the Palestinians or the South Africans or the people in Sudan. They feel this the part of the globe, I mean, of the global village. And they also see interconnected certain causes of justice that for us make, it, make them, I mean, I hear many of the older generation say, oh, but in any case, you see, they ask for uh, social justice, for gender identity justice, and for climate justice and justice in Palestine. They are so confused. No, they are so clear in their mind because all injustices are connected and bring back to a system which is white, dominated, and capitalist. Does Indeed. it make sense to you? And how do you see it? Perfectly, this? perfectly, perfectly. Not only do I, do I see it, but I had the experience of uh, discussing with uh, 
the encampment at the University of Southern California, some of the students there, who made a very articulate and eloquent case as to the connections between their predicament being young Americans in the United States and what's happening in Palestine. And the connection was made very concrete. They sem simply said exactly what you said before, that uh, the Israeli state is trying to do in Palestine what uh, the white uh, colonial settlers did in the United States. And, uh, and what happened? Okay, they subdued and totally effectively obliterated the natives. And the result was a very sad uh, and violent United States of America, uh, an America which uh, treats its own people in the same way that they treated its natives. Uh, they connected to the, you know, to Black Lives Matter. It, they connected it to the student debt, the contempt with which the regime in the United States treats young people, um, black men, black women, but also white trash. Yet that is working class American boys who are completely left to their own devices and effectively they are fed as water to Trump. So there was all this beautiful connection between the way in which um, white colon settler colonialism is generating uh, very sad and violent societies. And they could see the connection between the United States experience and the Israel-Palestine situation. So they felt com not just solidarity, but um, a connection uh, between their predicament and the predicament of the Palestinians. And so after that speech that I heard, when they said, unless Palestine is free, we are not free, it made sense. If you just say that to an average American, they say, what? Why can't I be free if Palestine is not free? Well, those students understood why. And I think they understand why, and they have tried it on their on their skin right now. Because mm -hmm. even Mahmoud Darwish was talking about Palestine as a metaphor. It has never been that to us through us now. Because Palestine is also a metaphor of how to form uh, and how to enforce injustice. Because think of the military industry that has trained itself on the on the shoulders of the Palestinians, battled, um, but field tested. This is how the Israeli weapons are sold. Field tested. What is the field? It's Palestinians' homes, the Palestinian homes, Palestinian villages. It's Gaza over and over. I keep on saying, never, never forget that five thousand people, including one thousand two hundred children, had been killed through five wars in a span of time of sixteen years, during which the Gaza people, two point three million people, in half of whom are children, were cramped in a ghetto. I mean, Israel is not carrying a war against another country, against an untrapped population in a ghetto. So they see that the, the techniques to annihilate the, the danger, the security threat, are the same. Police, the mili high, high police response uh, to the right to protest, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and militarization of the, of the counter protest, which mm -hmm. makes no sense. I mean, already cracking down on the on these basic freedoms is fascist. And we Europeans should see, on the one hand, the ascent of the right, populist, anti-Semitic, um, anti-Arab, Islamophobic, anti-gender identities, freedom of gender questions. And all of these re echoes a past that we should have not forgotten. But also, there is this, uh, this uh, increased crackdown on fundamental freedoms. So the, I think that they see that. They see that, they recognize that, they are bothered, they don't want it, and this is why Palestine is more and more the a cause that represents us all. Like, uh, and it's not we are Palace, we are all Charlies, we are pa all Palestinians. No, no, we are who we are, and because we are who we are, we want to, we want, uh, we want to be heard, which is amazing. And it's not just the, the, the protesters in the United States who feel that, we feel it in Europe. We have a European Parliament this Sunday, uh, everywhere, 
and uh, everywhere across Europe. And if you think about it, I don't know whether you, I didn't watch it, I have to tell you, I, I never watched this monstrosity, but I read a lot about it while it was happening, the Eurovision Song Contest. If you look at what happened, the whole of the Eurovision Song Contest this uh, year was completely taken over by Israel. Israel, the Israeli delegation, the Israeli music band was escorted during the, the competition by... Uh, a very heavy-handed uh, police force that was flown in from Israel, and that was in the heart of Europe. Uh, all the other delegations, music bands, were terrorized. Some of them were thrown out at the orders of the Israeli officials. Uh, so, you, you know, Europe is becoming more like this kind of Eurovision. You know, we have the Israelization of Europe. Uh, and if you think that I am um, exaggerating, consider this. No. The, the Prime think... Minister of Greece and the Prime Minister of Poland, Mr. Mitsotakis and Mr. Tusk, Donald Tusk, wrote a letter to the rest of the European Union, Prime Ministers and Presidents, Governments, and so on. Do you know about this letter? In this letter, they are proposing a new technological and investment drive by the European Union, which is going to be based on common debt and common financial instruments that will be used to finance an Israel-like dome made of missiles that will protect Europe. So the Israeli dome is becoming the model of not only European defense, but also of Europe, Europe's technological and economic development. And this was uh, received uh, very positively by Emmanuel Macron, and Olaf Scholz, the French president and the German chancellor. When I'm talking about Israelization of the European Union, I mean, I couldn't make up this, this letter and I couldn't make up the very positive reception of this letter. By the way, this is complete madness because even the Israeli dome lets in a few of these tiny little rockets by Hamas. Imagine if we invested all these trillions on an American-built dome around the European Union, along the lines of Israel's dome, against Putin. This is like telling Putin, who has 6,000 nuclear missiles ready, uh, you know, send a lot more of them to Europe because we have a dome and many of those will be knocked out. This is, you know, this is just madness gone absolutely berserk. Uh, and you can see the connection between the elevation of Israel as a model for the children, the children and the descendants of the white settlers who are now in power in Europe. And the very same people who you know, create concentration camps in Tunisia and, uh, um, and Libya for migrants who drown migrants in you know, whom they consider the intervention in, in, in the Mediterranean Sea. This whole thing, you know, is sort, sort of clicks in, it, it becomes one weaponized form of racism, which is being completely taken over by the model of Israel's uh, project of ethnic cleansing and militarizing everything. You know, and this is something I was discussing yesterday with, with some friends from the um, Tunisian civil society. I'm so, I'm so glad to be in Tunisia because at least being in the Arab world makes me Feel somewhat healed in that spiritual damage that this past eight months have provoked in me. And while in Europe there is such a big level of denial, I mean, people, of course, the 7th of October, I mean, you know, I've, I've condemned, 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 and condemned. But who wouldn't condemn the killing of civilians and the taking of Syria? I mean, we are not those kind of monsters. We are not the kind of monsters. Mm -hmm. The thing is that there have been I mean, there are now 36,000 people killed, 15 or 16,000 of whom are children. So why do we need to go back to the 7th of October in order to argue that why this is this this must stop? So yesterday I was discussing with Tunisian, um, well, like with Tunisian militants here, act political political militants and activists, and they were saying that it um, we they understand. They understand why there is what we call Israelization 
it's not Israelization. In fact, this is the West. They, we Western people keep on seeing the others and resenting the others as, as if they were savages. So it's not that Biden and, and Schultz have to really talk about that. The mm. rest of the world is naturally perceived as a threat. And this is why, and it's this mentality that doesn't allow us to recognize, to connect, to empathize with our brothers and sisters of a different color. Because for us, this is the fifth column in our societies. This is what, this is the deep-rooted racism that I'm talking about. We, yeah. we recognize each other. We recognize each other. And we recognize the other as different, as the other. So as there is the, uh, uh, Yanis, there is a, I'm sure you, you have heard of him. Uh, an Israeli historian was the one who has written the first article on genocide, calling what Israel was doing in, uh, in Gaza as a textbook case of genocide, uh, Raz Sigal. And he, uh, he was saying something the other, the other day we, we met in Germany, and it's very surreal to be in Germany and talk about Palestine, because you, I, you know what it is. At least you can be in Germany. You couldn't even go there. And you <laughs> couldn't experience the cognitive dissonance that you have in discussing Palestine with the Germans, who are also good fellows. I mean, I feel for them because they're also victims of a trauma. They've never processed, never processed their past. So, and they have relegated, like many in Europe, uh, the Holocaust to the concentration camp. So for them, what precedes that is not something that needs to be explored. Ras was saying Hitler has been defeated by his model, his fear of the other. He's wanted to build a pure race. Mm. One, because this is why we keep on seeing and talking and wanting to preserve Europe as a garden versus the jungle. That's well said. The you know the, the the idea of a united white Europe that uh, considers itself uh, a heavenly garden and everything outside it the jungle trying to invade it. Uh, that Hitlerite idea is uh, right at the heart of the European Union. We heard uh, uh, Mr. Borrell express it in precisely those those terms. Uh, we we created the eurozone, which I know I'm going into financial territory now, but uh, let me tell you when the first time there was a conference of uh, renowned, very important economists who discussed a common currency. Uh, it was in 1942 in Berlin. I won't say more. No more comments. I would read more about that. <laughs> I love how the the conversation naturally went into a comprehensive reading of our standpoint as a society to this phenomenon. But I think mm -hmm. that we, you both very well analyzed where we're at. Maybe the only thing missing is what we can do. I mean, spreading the awareness and uh, making pressure, maybe uh, disinvest, boycott and all the stuff. But are, they, are there any institutional a tool that we can use. We're seeing the ICC and the ICJ taking steps in that direction. Is that the balance that's shifting? I think we should not be stereoid about uh, the international justice system for one reason, because the, still, this is still the system that formed in the aftermath of, I mean, particularly the International Court of Justice in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War, when most of the world was still colonized. This is different, of course, from the ICC, mm -hmm. but the way the ICC functions doesn't make it immune to politicization, as we have seen. So the, the problem is that the multilateral system still reflects a, an immediate, uh, a reality of the immediate post-World War II. So the world has decolonized, but not to the fullest. And, um, and this is probably normal. It takes time for a uh, political system to regenerate, to really test, to really discover, embrace independence after, after centuries of slavery and, slavery and colonization. So there is a lot at stake for countries in the global south. Meanwhile, 
the global north has not really changed, has not really atoned for its past. And its DNA remains intact. And, um, and this is why I think today we are at a turning point with the question of Palestine, because the pa Palestine is testing the validity, the effectiveness of, this, of that system. Meaning, is it really a system uh, geared to ensure justice for all in the respect of freedom and dignity of all without discrimination? No, not yet. This is why the system on its own is not sufficient. It's upon us. I often say we, the people, refer to in the UN Charter, who eventually are the ultimate guarantors that the system works. Because our, let's say, the governments we, uh, we elect do not often respond to principle, principles of non-discrimination, equality, freedom, and uh, humanity. So we need to be active and engaged at whatever, whatever path of life we, comes from, we come from. You're absolutely right. Uh, and let's not forget that the, the, the West, which is uh, instrumental in enacting international law uh, and ought to play that role, uh, treats international law um, in an a la carte manner uh, with contempt. Uh, it uh, utilizes the, the, the courts, the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, whenever it suits them, and it ignores them when it doesn't suit them. Uh, the United States uh, has not signed up to any of the courts, has not ratified any of the treaties. They point blank refuse to have any American uh, appear in front of the court, even if they have killed millions of people. Uh, and therefore, the rest of the world is looking at these courts um, as um, a cross between a sad... Uh, confirmation of the absence of international law and a joke. So, we, you know, it, it is really important that the, that the IC goes ahead and accepts the recommendation of the prosecutor that Netanyahu is uh, uh, essentially arrested or be issued an arrest warrant. Uh, this is important. Already, both the ICJ and the ICC actions have uh, they've given us <laughs> a boost because let me speak personally for a moment. When uh, the German authorities insinuated, they didn't even have the guts to actually say it, but they insinuated that uh, because I was uh, um, talking about genocide in Palestine, I was somehow uh, breaking the law and I was uh, enabling terrorism. When you have the ICC issue a, a warrant or suggest that a warrant should be issued for the arrest of the Israeli prime minister, then suddenly uh, my work has been done for me, uh, at least at the dis discursive level. So these courts are important. We should support them. Uh, but let's not have a rose-tinted view of the capacity of uh, international law to make a difference. Uh, the occupations of uh, Harvard, of Columbia, of uh, uh, Sorbonne, or our universities, uh, the elections next Sunday across Europe, you know, a vote for parties like ours, if I may say this, that um, uh, explicitly support uh, the, um, you know, BDS, uh, boycotting, divesting and sanctioning Israel as um, uh, the most effective way of um, signaling to the Israeli regime that we are not going to accept th their genocidal policies anymore. These are the things that we should concentrate our efforts and energy on. I'm not involved in whatever manner in the, other than as, as a citizen myself of Europe, I'm not involved whatsoever in the elections, but I mean, in, actively. But it, the, the, the question is that there is a moment where political systems must pay. The fact that member states have disengaged with the International Court of Justice because they have, the fact that they have, the fact that, that, that there have been uh, three sets of provisional measures ordered uh, in the proceedings initiated by South Africa on, against Israel for the 
breach of the convention on, to prevent and punish genocide. The fact that there has been not an alignment to make sure that those provisional orders, provisional measures were enforced. I mean, this, this leads to the, to, to the further erosion of international law. To, why do we have this incredible and powerful normative framework for if it doesn't apply to everyone? And so, and also now the ICC, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's a, it's a huge change, not just symbolically. It's immense having the, the capacity for victims to, uh, to, for victims, I mean, for the Palestinians to see Netanyahu, who's been at the, at the, the leader of the last 20 years of government in, um, in, uh, in Palestine, sorry, in Israel. At the same time, at the same time, we need also to consider what's happening next, because justice, the, the pursuit of justice cannot be limited to, uh, to retributive justice. Who's going to rebuild the homes that Israel has destroyed? Israel needs to be held accountable as a state and not just through perpetrators. And this is why I think that not only the ICJ need to make its course, but member states need to take substantive measures, sanctions, sanctions, and sanctions. It's more than, than, than due. It was due before the 7th of October. The fact that Israel has never been sanctioned, this is part of the problem because it has, it has, it has continued to thrive in its impunity. And, and even now, when Israel is committing, don't want to call it genocide, call it atrocity crimes. The moment Israel is committing atrocity crimes, even now, Europe, continues to maintain its uh, association agreement being the primary economic partner, partner of Israel. This is our morality and as, a, as, a, as Europeans. And this is where morality ends, in my, in my view. Well, I will have to bid you farewell and congratulate you once more for everything you've been doing, Francesca, because I have an electoral rally to attend. This is the final stretch before the European Parliament elections, and uh, we are running. Um, thank you. I have thanked you in person uh, when others were not watching, but let me do it in public as well for your good work all these months and years. And congratulations for the book. Um, and I hope that uh, our roads keep on crossing uh, along the path towards uh, justice for Palestine. Hopefully. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you.